Okay, good morning, everyone. Let's settle in. Um, we will get started. So, thank you for coming. It's a wonderful day, the day uh, the University of Michigan Flint started 66 years ago. It's a very special day. It started as Flint Senior College, as most of you probably know. And over the last 66 years, it has grown. There have been ups and downs, but that's to be expected. Um, within the realm of American universities, U of M Flint um, is not even middle-aged. It's, it's a pretty young institution, 66-year-old. Also, I want to talk about Flint. Very important, when this institution started, Flint, the city of Flint, was known worldwide, manufacturing mecca, vehicle city. And let me say this to you. Um, my father worked in a steel mill. And he was lucky enough that the Indian government sent a group of people from that steel mill to the United States to get trained. So back in 1961, he was in the US for a year. After he went back to India, I was still, me and my sisters, um, I was four years old and stuff. So we used to have this thing in our family on occasions, Dad, so tell us about America. Tell me your American story. And of course, he got tired of it, right? But he used to say this, you know, the same story, same story. Probably he embellished it a little to, make, to keep him interested. But we were fascinated. You know, America, America. The cities that he would mention or the towns that he would, would mention is Cleveland, Pittsburgh, Flint, Detroit, sometimes Chicago. So as I grew up, you know, I always knew of, of Flint. So when I finished my doctoral work at Purdue and I got my first job in Ann Arbor, I wrote to my parents. So our family didn't have a phone. So I wrote to my parents and said, hey, I got a job in Ann Arbor. And they asked, where is Ann Arbor? It's close to Flint. OK, OK, it's fine. We know where you are. So Flint is a very special town, iconic American city. It has gone through a lot of ups and downs. And so has the university. As, as Mary Jo pointed out to me, you know, back in 1981, it was in a financial crisis, and the tuition increase was 18% at the U of M Flint. So a lot of change has happened to both the city and the university, and today we are at a similar situation. Things are not going as we want it to be. I shared with you that the enrollment this fall has many items for all of us to celebrate. Yes, it does. For the first time in five years, the, the FIDIAC enrollment is up. Uh, for the first time in 11 years, the transfer enrollment is up over 10%. Graduate enrollment is up, uh, retention is up, a lot of things to celebrate. But I also wrote in the message that overall enrollment is not. It has declined. And you know why that is. 
And let me explain very briefly. Anytime in a stable system, if you have a, a disturbance, uptick or a downtick, that has to travel through the four or five years. There's no way around it. When you have a large entering class, as you might read amongst other universities, that has to go through the system, and the system has to prepare for it. We have had declines, over declines, over declines, several years. So there is no way we can get out of it. We took the first step this year, we did, by addressing the first year enrollment, the entering people. If we can do it next year, and the year after, and the year after, it'll be stable. So as this chart shows all of you, um, as of now, over 30% we have declined. This is serious, or at least we should take it very seriously. And why is that? Well, every year, including this year, except last year where we held tuition flat, we increased tuition almost 5% a year. That's the maximum we could have done. We did it. But you know what? Even with that increase in tuition, inflation-adjusted revenue is down significantly. Just think about that. So when we see this chart, it's not just student numbers are down. Our revenue is down. Oftentimes, you will hear a measure that is used in higher education is students per faculty. Well, students per faculty is down. Students per faculty is another indication of whether your business model, and I know in higher education we don't like to use these terms, but it is reality. We have revenue, we have expenses, we have to cover. That's how it works. So for us, when you say students per faculty, which for us up until last time I checked with Fawn, was 13.6. That is close to what Kettering University has, 13. Every other public university in the state is 16, 17, 18, 20. We are 13.6. This is not financially viable. Furthermore, and it pains me to share this with you if you don't know, one in three students graduate in six years. One in two students, 50%, graduate in eight years. That is where we are today. This is the lowest graduation rate amongst the 15 publics. So look, all institutions, all regionals in the state and across the nation, if you read the Chronicle inside higher ed and so forth, you will hear that regional institutions, not the flagships, the regional institutions are going through significant challenges in the state as well as across the country. And we are right there with them. And therefore, we have to address it head on. To achieve long-term financial stability. And I have said this in my town hall, is the same slide with some minor changes. We have to recruit and retain students, which is whichever programs are doing very well in enrollment and has the capacity to grow based on employer demands, we have to find a way to grow them. We have to start new programs where there is a demand. We have to increase our retention rate, which this year at about 77% is 
is the high water mark in the last five years. But we have to do more. And we have to absolutely increase our graduation rate. We have to diversify our revenue streams. For an institution of higher education, there are usually five streams of revenue. A public institution. There's tuition, there's state appropriation, there is philanthropy, there is research in direct cost, and there is the licensing. These are major five sources of revenue. So we operate pretty much on state appropriation and tuition. We are increasing, we are working hard on philanthropy, things are moving ahead. Research, as you know, I have, I have created a new office, we have like funded it, it's doing very well, but it's gonna take a while. And licensing, we really don't have much, but still, we are trying. So when we talk about revenue stream, we need to look at all five and see where we can make a positive movement. We have to control costs, and there I think we are doing reasonably well. We are controlling costs. I have written to you multiple times how I have reduced administrative costs, I have reduced personnel. In my own office, I have done that. So I'm not asking you to do anything that I have not done myself. We have to make programmatic and, and budgetary changes for long-term stability. Um, the best example is Gen Ed. I've heard this from the day I came, August of 2019. The duplication of Gen Ed courses outside of CAS, this is not the way to go. We do not we, we have to find a way that the budget model supports a centralized gen ed that is pretty much done by College of Arts and Sciences. The other units must not duplicate courses just to earn the enrollment-based revenue. I have said this from my first semester, and I'm saying it now. So these changes we have to make. And new initiatives have to be funded, no matter what our budget situation is. New programs have to be created. Student support has to be done. But we have to do it like we have been doing, repurposing finances. Every dollar that I have saved in my office in upper administration, I have repurposed it for research and scholarship. There's no new money, but you can check with Heather Dawson, you can check with Randy, all the research clusters and all initiatives, the Urban Institute, all of that is being funded through the office of the chancellor by repurposing funds. So we are doing all of these things, and we have to continue to do it. But I cannot stand here and say to you that just doing this is going to be enough. It will not. This state has a declining high school population, as all of you know. Fewer of those kids are coming to college. So we have to reinvent ourselves. We have to. This is the opportunity that faces us. This is the challenge. It's the opportunity. So um, I, have, I have discussed this with, with President Coleman, with the regents, multiple times. And through those discussions, President Coleman has charged me to lead a strategic transformation process. And now I'll invite President Coleman to say what she expects out of this. Thank you, Deba, and good morning to everyone. And thank you to so many members of the UM Flint community for joining us today. I encourage you to stay involved in this process of innovation and transformation over the coming months. With the support 
of the Board of Regents, I have charged Chancellor Duda with developing a robust vision and plan that maximizes the opportunities for survival and long-term financial viability of the Flint campus. We are focused on student success and value to the state and the community in a very fast changing world. As the chancellor is explaining this morning, the financial realities facing this campus are significant. I want to be direct. Incremental progress is not enough, nor will it be sustainable going forward. Everyone should be proud of this semester's enrollment growth with new students. It does not, however, alter the need to transform UM Flint to reach its goals of financial viability and academic strength. The Chancellor will share with you how the process will work so that UM Flint can emerge strong and sustainable. With the right plan, UM Flint can focus on innovation, improvement, and student success. President-elect Santa Ono supports this effort and looks forward to getting involved once he starts at the university in mid-October. I want to emphasize that no decisions have been made. We are taking the process seriously and we want your input and involvement. So now, I'll turn it back to Chancellor Dada. Thank you, Mayor Sue. And I just wanted to share with you that President Coleman was fully on board. She would be here with me today. It was very important for her. But it also happens, for those of you who might have read the, the record, after 28 years, Steve Grafton, who is the president of the Alumni Association, is retiring. And therefore, this afternoon at lunchtime, 11.30, they have an event, so the trustees and President Coleman are going to have to attend that. And that's the only reason why she could not be here in person. So let me, as, as she mentioned, it's a process we are beginning today as I speak to you. And I expect this as the regents do, as President Coleman does, that this will be a transparent, inclusive, and data-driven process. I have just a few more slides. So if any of you are expecting something heavy, no, no. This is just about how the process will work. And I also want you to know, this is what we have initially come up with. Give me your feedback. Give us your feedback. If things need to be changed, we will consider those. We will do it together. I make you this promise. This transformation will not succeed. I repeat, will not succeed unless faculty, staff, students, administrators work together. So what do we see? As best as I can tell at this point, the engagement groups we will have a, a transformation advisory committee, ITAC. And this will be faculty members. We have not selected it, so there aren't any names to share. After this, we would want names from which we will compose this. There is a steering committee, which is right behind me, deans and the cabinets. So those names are already there. Faculty Senate Council established. I meet with them every month. I'm happy to meet with them, and I think I will meet with them more frequently. Staff Council, also I meet with them and will be happy to meet with them more frequently. And Student Government, I meet with them, will be happy to meet with them more frequently. So this is what we have now. I, I want to emphasize, as we thought about a process, which I'm going to share with you, 
these are the bodies that we thought should be engaged. But there is a lot more. There is a lot more. And this chart shares how we think the communication, feedback, and input is going to work. There will be multiple town halls with entire faculty, staff, and students. There will be unit forums, departments, schools, um, or, uh, administrative units. So those have to be organized. And there I seek your feedback, and I seek the feedback of the deans. What might be the best way to engage faculty, staff, and students such that we get input and feedback to inform the process. There will be focus groups of elected officials, student government, faculty senate council. There will be individual interviews of regents, um, the senate, and if you so choose, we will have small groups, and the Faculty Senate Council can advise me who all should be in there. So these are preliminary ideas that we have brainstormed, and we, we put it out for your consideration. There will be a transformation website that will launch as soon as this town hall ends. It is a basic website as of now. It will be populated with information. There is in that website, as of now, an opportunity for anybody to give feedback, which will be sent to me and, and everybody else on this, on this platform. And a campus message will go out next week based on the feedback we get now, what are the next steps? So I have this chart out here which captures most of it as a block, but we'll have to sequence this. So I will be sending out that message next week. What is the timeline? So communications and engagement has already begun. Okay. I see someone taking pictures. These slides will be on the post, but absolutely, go ahead and take pictures. We are posting it on the web, absolutely. So visioning and planning is where we are today, okay? And it will, it will continue for about 30 days. Market demand analysis, academic program analysis, and then a, a business case and implementation plan. All of this, as you know, we don't have the capacity to do. My office is unable to do it. So in conversations with the president's office, we have, Ann Arbor has helped us with Huron Consulting Group. They will be helping in the market demand, academic program analysis, and business case, and also communication. And we have some members of Huron with us today. So you understand, we don't have the capacity to do it, and Huron is well-established, well-reputed firm. They have worked with many universities doing similar kind of work. So they will be able to tap into their knowledge base. They will be able to contextualize with our help about strategies that might work. And I say might, because no decisions will be made until this is presented to president and the regions. We will create options and strategies. So, if you are wondering what does market demand analysis mean? Well, it, 
It means understanding the market of students, the learners, what kind of programs are they interested in, also understanding what our employers are interested in. That is roughly what will happen. Academic program analysis, they will look at our program portfolio as it is now and try to match that with the information they got from the market demand analysis and make certain recommendations as to there are opportunities here there are opportunities to expand existing programs. Employers are looking for this kind of skill sets. So that's a cross matching. And then they will help us with a business case, a financial analysis, a pro forma, and some plans about implementation. So this information then will be looked at through the following flowchart. So the core project team will have people from this campus, people from Ann Arbor, and Huron consultants. They will get the feedback on the top side as you see the three arrows. They will get the feedback from the town halls, focus groups, any kind of engagement that we do. And then we also have two project advisors. Jeff Chattis is the new uh, CFO, Executive Vice President in Ann Arbor. He is in his first year. His office has, has provided, continues to provide a lot of help to me. And also we have Tim Slaughter, who is a former CFO. I think some of you might recognize the name. Experienced, well experienced with U of M information. And then after he left U of M, I don't know if, if you remember, he became the president of University of Phoenix. So he brings in as a knowledge base which is very helpful, understanding employers and what they need and so forth. So these two officers will be helping us as advisors. As I said, there is the ITAC group the faculty group and the steering committee, they will get information, they will, they will deliberate over it, they will work with Huron and others, and then they will make these options available to me, which I will look into and I will share with the President and the Board of Regents. Again, please understand, this is what we created initially. If through this conversation and conversation next week and feedback next week, if we need to change, we will change. Okay? We want your ideas. I want you to think about it. If you think there is a a better way to do this, a more efficient way to do this, or a more inclusive way to do this? Absolutely. Please let us know. So this is my last slide. Because no decisions have been made. There was no mention of any discipline, any college. No. We are looking at it institution-wide. And let me say one last thing. It is not only programs that we will focus on. Through this process, it's an opportunity for us to look at programs and pedagogy and student advising. What can we do? We can get good information from Huron about advising, new models of advising, what are important for retention, what things need to be looked at for improving the graduation rates. So Huron has wide body of knowledge they have accumulated over the years working with many institutions across the country. So this is not only a programmatic focus, it is also a focus on other parts of the institution where we can do things better for the purposes of creating 
a U of M Flint that is academically strong, programmatically relevant, and financially viable long into the future. Thank you for your attention. And now what we will do, what we have planned is, so, so there is a mic out here. And I have drafted Dr. David Luke, who you all know, the Chief Diversity Officer, and Shade Wilson, the, the Chair of the Staff Council. They will help moderate the Q&A. So I would ask you, any of you who have any questions, to come here, ask your question. I promise no answers, because a lot I don't know. But we will certainly make note of the questions and use it to improve our process. Thank you. Hello. Oh, good, the mic is on. It wasn't on a second ago. Um, so I was the one taking the pictures, and I want to explain why. Um, so hi, I'm Kim Sachs, um, political science, public administration. I am the director of the Master of Public Administration program. And um, this is Strategic Planning 101. And we teach our students strategic planning all the time. And we talk about it. We do case studies. We do um, mock examples. So part of the reason I'm taking pictures is to actually use them in class. Um, and I know you'll have the slides up, but we're actually talking about this in class on Monday. So just in case, I'm, I'm grabbing pictures now. Um, but there's two things that concern me. One is um, it seems like the process is very top down. I know you said you'll have this, um, I forget the name of the committee that's the, uh, basically. ITAC. 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 Yeah. Right. So it seems like those people are going to be hand picked. And in my experience here for nine years, the people that get hand picked are the people that are going to agree with a certain viewpoint already. So that's, that's concern one. Concern two is reflected in the room here and in some of the slides there, which is it doesn't seem like the wider community is being represented. So what I mean by that is, and especially in the city of Flint, the wider community is usually not represented. We sit in, a Flitty, in Flint, which is a city that has been routinely pushed aside, often to literally uh, life and death circumstances. And yet again, this institution is kind of pushing them to the side in this process. And as someone who studies policy and its effects, this public institution has a duty to include them in this process. So I see employers, which is fine, which is great. Um, I would like to see um, our, you know, it's great that our students are here, but I would like to see the wider community involved, the citizens of Flint, um, because this is their institution too. They welcome us into their city and um, they will only continue to do so as much as we welcome them into these processes. So those are my concerns. I'd love to have my students talk to you about these processes. I, I think this is something that they would love to have some feedback in as well. So. Thank you, Kim. So let me first make you an offer. If you want me to attend a class of yours where you're talking about this, I'll be happy to attend. Always learning. Let me take your two points in reverse order. The community, absolutely. We just did not know how large a hall we will have and to bring the folks in. So next steps will include conversations either in a town hall format or focus group or small groups with the community. Absolutely. That is always the plan. And I will go on and say one step more. Our futures are intricately tied. U of M Flint cannot be successful without Flint being successful and vice versa. I talk to the mayor all the time. So please understand, we will do this, we will do it together. But, but this is ultimately the University of Michigan Flint. We will make our decisions. We will take their input, absolutely but we will make our decisions. To your point about being top-down, well, I'm sorry. If this appears to you to be top-down, I get it. You give us your feedback. How can this be made? How can it be flattened? I believe in administration, a flattened administration. So you tell me, or, or let's get some ideas, we will also, please understand, we will have to manage the process. 
So, so it's a combination, but I'm open to your ideas. And thank you for asking. Good morning, Jennifer Blackwood, Director of Physical Therapy. Thankful for the opportunity and thank you to President Coleman and the Regents to have this conversation um, about our campus in Flint, Michigan. Um, if I've talked to anybody, one thing I'm definitely passionate about is, is our campus, but also the community. So appreciate the comment and I'm just gonna follow in with that. Relative to our high school and our, um, our graduates in the area. So I do think that, I know we're gonna have these town halls, but truly to be uh, uh, forward thinking in a sense of encouraging our high school grad, or our, our juniors and seniors in high school and their parents to find out why Flint is not the choice for them. Um, as much as I try to convince my, my, my children's parents and or their friends uh, about our campus, there's something different. And I think we just need to recognize that and then we need to build a model that supports that as well. You know, certainly uh, the cost of higher education is a concern for many individuals. And I think that's a piece of what we offer, but I think being creative in the way that we encourage undergraduates to come to our campus is certainly a part of what we probably are, are all going to consider, but just wanted to speak on behalf of those students that are really questioning the college experience. And one of the things that resonates with me is sports. So if we get a chance to have a, uh, you know, maybe a, a club league, if you will, for a couple of different sports, I think that'd be helpful because Dearborn gets that opportunity. So that might be a win-win for us. And uh, I don't need any more comments or, qu or considerations, but thank you for the chance and thank you for today. And thank you, Jennifer. Um, all points well taken. There isn't anything I can say off the top other than agreeing with everything that you said. Uh, the only one comment I would like to make is because we have had this conversation with the deans and faculty. The undergraduate students really I mean, even if it is not a residential campus, they come for a campus experience. So to the extent that we can have in-person classes and activities that make the campus look busy, vibrant, energetic, it helps the student experience. It helps our recruitment. Talk to Joe Vayner, talk to Chris Lewis. This is what they will say. However, um, in the graduate domain, we do have some flexibility. Uh, more mature students, they are mostly working. Their flexibility is very important. So, so we'll have to strike that balance. But I am all for increasing campus experience, in-person classes, and vibrancy. Yes. Shan Parker, Public Health and Health Sciences. I'd just like to thank our administration for this opportunity to, to come together and talk. So I have a comment, and then I have um, not even a question, but more of a suggestion around community engagement. So I am very happy to hear that we're gonna have a plan to transform our campus. It has been very clear that we've needed to move in a very different direction for a very long time. So I'm happy that we, I'm hoping that we as a campus can come together behind this initiative and really move us out of this situation that we're in. So that's my comment. So we are a faculty here who's very much engaged in this community. There are a, a number of experts who do a lot of work in this community. So I'm happy to see that the community is going to be consulted around this. Mm -hmm. I think that is so important because we often are losing our students right here in our local and regional community, right? So what I'm coming to say is how can we help as a faculty um, to help engage our community in this process? Because we build these relationships. We do not want to see our relationships yeah. ruined by having external folks sometime come in and do what they do. So we have experts here. How can we help engage the community in this process? Shan, good to see you after a long time. Yes. <laughs> uh, COVID notwithstanding. Um, I take your point. I, I, I think the community piece of this is critically important. Mm -hmm. uh, I know many units have very strong relations and interactions and engagement with the community. And CHS has many programs there. So I think what we will have to do 
not just say that we already have our engagement with we, for this specific strategic planning process, we will have to find a way to leverage the information knowledge that all of you have and bring them in into the fold of this. I don't have the answer, but the point is noted. We will take it seriously. We will come back to you uh, and others. By you, I mean the, the, mm -hmm. the, the community. And see what, what we can do, how best we can involve them get their feedback, get their buy-in into mm -hmm. this transformation because this is as much for us as it is for the community. Thank you. As you can see on the screen, three regions have joined us. So uh, if you have any questions and comments, they can also chime in. So. Yes, sir. Hi, Patrick Nair, student. Uh, uh, I guess I want to talk from a different perspective. Yeah. Um, I'm a new student here. I'm a non-traditional student. I am a 47-year-old single father of three who lives in the city of Flint, can walk to campus. The campus doesn't look like the community. The campus doesn't feel like it's a part of the community. You got a school less than a half a mile that's shut down. We don't, I'm, I'm seeing different things around the community that you, it, the, camp, the, 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 the school itself doesn't seem like it's, it, it's a part of the city of Flint. And that doesn't make it to where anybody would want to be a part of it. Um, and, and, and I don't represent the whole city of Flint. This is just my opinion. But what I realize is I know the, the, the I, I, I worked as a coach in the schools. I see the small kids that don't have parents or parents that have, that, that can't do certain things because of their jobs and things like that, that, that affects. And so they're not focused on, and some of them need to come back to school to get a better education, to get a better job. But they're not focused on that because they're so focused on the things that's going on right there in their life right now. And my theory is a degree ain't nothing but a piece of tissue if you need to wipe your butt if you ain't doing nothing with it. So that being said, what can we do to help the people that's right around us. Because if we can't start with the smaller people that needs to get in the beginning stages, if you can't get the kids to want to be a part of something, they're going to want to go somewhere else. I have a seven-year-old, a 10-year-old, and a 12-year-old, and I've been, a, been, been coaching for, for their schools since they, they first started in school. Within that, I've coached over 75 different kids at one point, at one time. And I see different aspects of what parents need because of that. Because of that, that being, you see where these kids are not learning certain things. And the so first thing they want to do is run away from Flint. So they don't want to be coming here instead of going somewhere else. But if there was more involvement, like, for instance, I know that they, 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 some, uh, some places, I'm not, I can't mention that right now, but some people are vo volunteering to work in a robotics program. Well, why don't you bring that right there to that school right there mm -hmm. that needs it? Mm -hmm. why, won't this, why won't you of them represent themselves with the, with the schools that's right around them, at least in a, in a one-mile radius, mm -hmm. if nothing else, and see then the, the, the community get more involved in this, and then U of M, and that would actually help bring enrollment back. That's just my, my thoughts. And your name was again? Patrick Nard. Look, Patrick, uh, first of all, um, I'm very glad that you are a student here um, and that you live here, and you have perspectives which you just shared with us very briefly. I'm sure you have a lot more to share with us. Uh, it's very important for us to hear this. Now, um, I have always believed, and I hear this from 
the public officials that U of M Flint is a beacon of hope for the city and the region. Uh, that's that's a, a catchy phrase. What really does it mean, and are we living up to that? From what you're saying, we are not. And it is our aspiration, and it is our goal and our hope that we address the kind of issues you have mentioned. But let me draw on uh, the School of Education Dean who is here. If you want to say anything about the programs that we might have in the community, is there anything you want to say there? To Patrick. Patrick. Thank you for sharing something that I think is very, very important. And one of the things we've been looking at is how do we think of ourselves as a birth to 20 system? And, this, and we're part of the Flint system. And so we've really been reaching out to the Flint community schools in particular to try to develop and be trustworthy partners. So there's, you know, I can talk about specific things about trying to create pathways for um, uh, high school students and to become special ed teachers or other teachers, these different works that we're doing. We're also in conversation about different curriculum that we can help support in the school districts. But your point is very well taken and we're laser focused on this, how do we fit into the community? It's become part of our ethos. And so I hope that we can move towards meeting those uh, goals that you set. Uh, we're, having, uh, we're hosting 168 students from Genesee County to come who might want to be teachers and trying to get them feel, to feel connected and how can we support them. And, and our goal is we want them to come to U of M Flint, but how do we help the students just see aspirations for going to, to college? How do we be part of that system? So I really appreciate your comments. I was just like sitting there thinking, you speak my language and I'd love to hear more about what you have to say. Thank you so much. Thank you, Beth. And yeah, you go ahead. I do want to say this. In no way, form, or fashion am I bashing the school because I've, since I've been here, I have really, really enjoyed the faculty, staff, everybody that's here. And it's given me a totally different college perspective than the college that I went to before. So this is what the city of Flint needs. Yeah. I want to make sure that I do say that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kiara May, and I am the Executive Director of the Downtown Development Authority. I wasn't going to speak, but I wanted to take this chance to just address everybody and give a piece of my feedback because I am kind of the, the gatekeeper of downtown. I've been here for a year and five months, um, and I feel as though U of M kind of just sits in its own bubble. Um, I have received interns from everybody else, MSU, Kettering University, Mott, but not U of M. I basically had to stalk a couple of people to even get them to respond to me. Um, I deal with every form of, um, every form of the community because I'm downtown. We plant trees, flowers, and if, I'm sorry, if you guys don't know what the Downtown Development Authority is, we are nonprofit. We give out those pesky parking tickets that you guys have may have gotten downtown. Um, but I work hand in hand with government. We plant trees and flowers downtown. We deal with the small businesses. Um, we deal with community engagement. We do just about everything. We're kind of like Santa's little helpers that just, just appear downtown and, um, I was a residential advisor back at Wayne State University, so I know what it's like to go to a commuter school. I know what it's like to try to get students engaged, um, and maybe they don't want to live on campus or whatever the case may be, but I hear so much from U of M um, trying to kind of find its own lane or be like other schools. You don't have to be like anybody else. You guys are U of M. You need to live in that and stand in that. And what I don't see from you guys is just being who you are. Who is U of M? It's not Kettering. It's not Mott. You guys need to represent that. There's no piece of marketing 
downtown that represents you guys. It's like you guys don't even exist. And I'm not bashing the school at all because I come from an economic development background. We need you here, but you have to be here. What does that look like? And as somebody who works, lives, and plays downtown, I hear you say you guys want to be invested in the community. It starts with supporting the small businesses downtown. It starts with coming to the tree lightings, coming to the different festivals, being present, being seen, having tables. That's what community engagement looks like. And I feel as though, and instead of talking about the issues, it's time to address them and not be performative. Thank so, you. take that with you. Thank you guys for your time. Thank you very much. Um, point well taken, and it's been reiterated in, in other forms. Uh, let's, let's just make a commitment that this transformation that we are talking about is a transformation that addresses the best it can on this very important point. It doesn't make any sense to say that if Flint succeeds, we do, or vice versa. We have to live it. And I think we are hearing from community members that we haven't been doing so. Uh, I, I just want to say that, that I do want to give the regents and the president just a couple of minutes at the end to make any remarks they might want to. But go ahead, Mary Jo. Okay, thank you. Mary Jo Sikelski, University Advancement. The fact that this is taking place on the day that the university opened 66 years ago is not lost on me, and I trust it is not lost on most people in this room. So thank you very much. Uh, Steve Jobs said, innovation distinguishes between a leader and a follower. And as many have said uh, at this podium before me, it is time for us to innovate. I think about our forefathers, Billy Durant, Charles Stuart Mott, Connie Nelson. Where would we be in Flint, Michigan? Where would the state of Michigan be had we not followed these entrepreneurs and innovators? I suspect that there will be times during this process that we will not agree. But I believe this plan will take uh, our collective and our individual support. We need to wrap our arms around this process if it is going to be successful. So I don't have a question, but I would ask that at any point that ITAC realizes this process is unraveling, that we come together again, like this today, to remind ourselves and one another that we are all in this together. Uh, to Kim, I'd like to say, I will make sure that alumni are involved in this process, not only locally, but across the globe. They will want to be a part of this process. And to Patrick, I don't know where Patrick went, but as right a future there. alum, okay, Patrick, I'm going to get your number when I leave this podium, <laughs> and I would like to have lunch with you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Jo. Thank you. Um, so um, I, I, she didn't have a question, but I do have a response, and that is something that President Coleman said yesterday in her opening remarks, and it stayed with me. She said, we are Michigan. When we encounter a challenge, we look to solutions. And that's exactly where we are. We recognize the challenge, and we have come together to develop solutions, and that we will. So with that, let me say this is the last question. Yes, I see that Shade is nodding. And then I'm going to give uh, the video uh, participants, John. Yes, Levi. 
Thank you, Chancellor Dutta. Uh, President Coleman, uh, members of the Board of Regents, uh, to our cabinet and our wonderful deans. Um, Chancellor Dutta, thank you for your leadership. Um, when I think of Flint, I think of a city that is resilient. Flint has seen its share of crises and inequity. Like, as you all know, the General Motors pulling out in the 80s, the Great Recession of 08, um, the Flint water crisis, and now a pandemic. But the city of Flint always bounces back. Don't sleep on Flintstones. We are resilient and we always rise from the ashes. U of M Flint also has that same resiliency. That has been proven by our chancellor's announcement yesterday with the increase of new student enrollment, high retention rates of our Promise Scholar program, and so much more. But I'm here today to talk about what does it look like the, for the future of U of M Flint? When I see a $300 million investment into Detroit, into the new research facility, I can just think, what would $300 million do to a city like Flint? We have all of these people talking about community and how we, as an institution, need to be a part of the community and work with the community. And we're doing a great job. We are, um, we are taking strides. We are an anchor in this, in, this, in, in this city, in this region, but I think we can do so much more. But that's not going to come with Band-Aids. We need real fiscal dollars. We need real help and so that we can go into those communities, so we can go into Flint and make a difference. Thank you, President Coleman. Thank you to the Regents. Thank you, Chancellor Dutta, for your leadership. We have a lot of work to do, but I'm confident that we're going to do it together. And everyone, make sure you come to the Wolverine Homecoming Parade tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. I, I fully agree with everything you said, Levi, but I'm going to turn it on you as well. You are in the governor's office. Yes. Give us some ideas. <laughs> Give us some ideas how we can get a outsized influence in any of these things. So uh, let me invite. Um, President Coleman and Regent Brown to make any remarks they would like to. Well, I'd just like to start by uh, really congratulating both you, Chancellor Dutta, and the whole Flint uh, campus and community for being willing to take on this task. Uh, it's very important, and I am very impressed with the turnout today and with the comments from all the speakers, and I appreciate that very much. And now I turn it over to our board chair, <laughs> Regent Brown. Sure. Thank you, President Coleman. Um, I, I, I mostly, I'm, I'm humbled and so excited about what we're starting here and, and what I'm already seeing as the community engagement, because that's really the key. Uh, and as publicly elected officials, um, that's something we care about very, very much. This is a university um, that really belongs to Flint and Genesee County in the state. So we want to hear from all of the citizens, not just our students and faculty, um, but everyone in the, especially in that region, exactly what they want Flint to be. Um, I know Chancellor Dutta is the leader to get us there. Um, and I know that all of the board will support this effort in every way we can. So thank you. Thank you. Regent uh, Beam. Thank you, thank you, Chancellor Dutta. Uh, sorry, I was a little late to the meeting. I was in a, a court hearing uh, this morning, but um, I sound a little bit uh, like I'm repeating what Regent Brown said, uh, but the board is fully behind uh, U of M Flint and uh, you know going uh, through this process. Uh, I'm also, uh, I live in Genesee County. Um, I uh, attended U of M Flint uh, for classes during summer school. Uh, so it is near and dear to me. I've uh, lived in Genesee County my entire life, except when I was uh, uh, in college uh, in Ann Arbor. Uh, so uh, its uh, success is something that's very uh, personal and important to me. Uh, my wife and I work downtown uh, every day. And so uh, I am, when I see uh, the people and recognize uh, Doug and recognize Mary Jo and I saw Levi uh, last week. Uh, I uh, 
am you know, looking forward to participating in this process, hearing what everyone has to say, and uh, taking everyone's opinions very seriously uh, through this process. Thanks so much. Thank you. And Vice Chair Hubbard. Thank you. Uh, agree with my colleagues. I think we must have bold changes at U of M Flint. I support the efforts of Chancellor Dutta, but um, to turn around some of those numbers on these graphs, we've really got to be transformative. We've got to engage the community. I appreciate everyone's participation today, and I look forward to having a very transformative result out of this process. Thank you. And I thank all of you. Who uh, Deb, I'd like to say something as well, Region Illich. Oh, yes, please. I'm sorry. Yeah, Region That's Illich. That's okay. Thank you. I just want to reiterate my colleagues, but just say that I am e extremely optimistic and excited about this process. I support it fully and really want to thank the community for being here today. The comments were really informative and helpful. And I encourage all of you to please be part of this process. We need you in order for this to be a complete success. Thank you. Thank you. If there are any other regions by phone and would like to speak, because I'm not seeing you on the screen. Going once, going twice. All right. So thank you, everyone. Uh, it's, please consider this as step zero of the process. We are just launching it. I look forward to interacting with all of you and moving it forward. Thank you. Go Blue.